What's up guys, CJ here and welcome back to another all new Game of Thrones season recap, the second in our series trying to get you all caught up before the debut of season 7 in just 10 days on July 16th. This time we're running through the show's second season, one of the most exciting in the series up to this point, with the War of Five Kings in full swing, massive battles, twists, turns, bloody murders, and generally everything we expect and love from Game of Thrones. When Season 2 picks up, the Stark family is still reeling from the death of Ned at the order of newly crowned King Joffrey. Rob's raised an army, declaring himself King in the North, and won several battles since, even taking Jaime Lannister hostage. Arya Stark continues her quest north to Winterfell, delayed and eventually kidnapped by Tywin Lannister's men. Fortunately for her, she links up with the shape-shifting assassin Jack and Hagar, who helps her escape and sets her on her way to becoming an assassin herself a couple of seasons down the road. Meanwhile, in King's Landing, Sansa is still held captive as the betrothed of Joffrey, and in a major twist, Tyrion Lannister has been named Hand of the Young King, serving till his father, Tywin, returns from battling Rob. Maybe one of the most interesting things about this second season is the addition or expansion of major players. For the former, Robert's brother Stannis, the true heir to the throne, has emerged to claim the crown thanks to a heads-up from Ned Stark before his death. What he lacks in charm, he makes up for in funky but seemingly true religion, worshipping the Lord of Light, and also hangs out with your new favorite character, Sir Davos Seaworth, one of his knights and most trusted advisors. Speaking of that funky religious stuff, worshipping R'hllor also comes with your very own Red Priestess, Melisandre, who claims that you are Azor High Reborn, the prince that was promised, destined to be king and eventually defeat the White Walkers. As for expanded characters, Robert and Stannis' younger brother Renly has also emerged to claim the throne. He's a people's champion, more likable and charismatic than the hardened Stannis, but not the drunken lout that Robert had become. He doesn't have a true claim to the throne, but thanks to his new wife Marjorie Tyrell, he has the support and soldiers of her powerful family, which, coupled with the people's love for him, instantly makes him a major player in the war. The two brothers fatefully meet at Renly's camp as they're facing down for battle. While Stannis was hopelessly outnumbered, thanks to some Lord of Light sorcery, Melisandre gives birth to a shadow creature, which sneaks in and assassinates Renly just after he had agreed to team up with Robb Stark. In the ensuing chaos, one of his king's guard, Brienne of Tarth, flees with Caitlyn Stark, who had brokered the short-lived alliance, and while the Tyrells return to their castle at Highgarden, the rest of Renly's troops join Stannis, backing up his legitimate claim to the throne with massive firepower. In one of the most memorable episodes of the series, Stannis' forces attack King's Landing. Tyrion leads the city's defense, coming up with an ingenious strategy and destroying Stannis' fleet with wildfire. This forces a land invasion that's eventually shattered by the combined forces of Tywin Lannister and the Tyrells, who have linked up with the Lannisters following Renly's death on the promise that Joffrey will marry Marjorie instead of Sansa. After returning to Rob's camp, Caitlin frees Jaime and tasks Brienne of Tarth with delivering him to King's Landing, attempting to secure the release of Sansa and Arya, who the Lannisters claim to have. This infuriates Rob, who doesn't really have a leg to stand on as he sacrifices a valuable alliance with the Freys by choosing to marry a nurse from his army, rather than one of Walder Frey's daughters as he had agreed to, but I'm sure that won't come back to bite him at all. Up in Winterfell, Bran is essentially the lord while Rob's away fighting the war, and interestingly enough, he's also begun having prophetic dreams of the future, predominantly seeing a three-eyed raven, and remember that for future seasons. Unfortunately, despite him doing a generally good job at temping, it all comes crashing down thanks to Theon Greyjoy. Now, Theon had been a ward of the Starks, essentially a noble hostage, after his father Balin unsuccessfully rebelled against Robert in the early years of the King's reign. Despite this, he had been essentially raised by the Starks in Winterfell, and he was loyal to the family, working with Rob and convincing him to let him return to his father and his home in the Iron Islands to try and secure the Winterfell army a fleet. This, of course, led to an inevitable heel turn, and soon enough, Theon had taken the unprotected Winterfell for the Ironborn. However, Bran and Rickon managed to escape with Hodor, while Theon, refusing to abandon the castle despite being hopelessly outnumbered by a superior force, is left by the Ironborn to be captured by Roose Bolton's bastard son, Ramsay Snow, but more on him next season. Meanwhile, across the Narrow Sea, Daenerys has fallen on hard times since Drogo's death. With the cow gone, the Kalasar abandoned her, and now her and the few that remain are essentially sitting ducks out in the desert. Her wandering army eventually stumbles upon the city of Karth. Navigating the politics of an unfamiliar city proves a little too difficult for the young queen, as time and time again she tries and fails to seek her passage to Westeros. The plot thickens as out one day, she returns home to find her dragons stolen and many of her subjects dead. A nobleman, Zarojo and Daxos, stole them to make a play for the throne of Karth. 
Traveling to the House of the Undying to confront the warlock Jaro had teamed up with, she manages to defeat them by having her dragons set their leader on fire, and returns to lock Jaro to die in his own vault and looting enough from his house to buy a ship. Far to the north, John and a huge number of the remaining troops at Castle Black have marched beyond the Wall on a scouting expedition to find out more about the White Walkers. They eventually make camp at the Fist of the First Men and link up with legendary scout Corrin Halfhand. Despite the greater threat of the White Walkers, a new threat emerges, an army of wildlings led by former Night's Watchman Mance Raider. John scouts ahead with Corrin and eventually both are captured by the wildlings. In a last ditch attempt to infiltrate their enemy, Corrin sacrifices his own life in a duel against John, successfully cementing the illusion that John is deserting to the wildling cause as he learns that the wildling army is even larger than they had imagined. But back at the Fist of the First Men, under cover of a blizzard, hundreds of White Walkers march on the dwindled forces of the Night's Watch. And that about does it for season two of Game of Thrones. As I said, twists, turns, blood, betrayal, everything we've come to expect from the series. Be sure to turn in on Saturday as we'll break down season three, maybe the most memorable so far with even more of that stuff that I mentioned just a few seconds ago. So let me know what your favorite moment of season two was in the comment section down below, but that's gonna do it for me here. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to smash that like if you like what you saw, subscribe for more great content every single day, and consider turning on your notifications to be alerted every time we upload a new video. Signing off, this is CJ, and I'll see you next time.